can see this is the cylinder that I just uh, finished boring and you look you look down that barrel and it's it's pretty finish is pretty acceptable looking but uh, that's in, in a way it's sort of a false a false uh, thing there okay now now we're getting a little bit closer uh, view of that cylinder which I just uh, bored you can see you know a little bit of evidence uh, under closer inspection of some horizontal lines in there now, if you, if you put your, your finger in there and run your finger across that, it's as smooth as glass. And you wouldn't even think that that thing was anywhere near be, be uh, what you call a rough finish. What I have been doing to show people in the factory, I learned the factory, you take this penny and rub across the edge there. And then you can see on that penny, I don't know if you can see that flat spot right by my thumb there, but uh, that's what that did to that penny. There's a little you know, flat around the edge of that rim, it took the rim right off just of that little life. So we're going to have to, that's why you have to home these things and get the proper finish. And we're going to be using a number 300 stone uh, to do the cylinder, which is going to give you roughly about a, right around a 130 finish, which is what they really require. Okay, we've got the, uh, we've got the uh, measurement of the piston and everything on the micrometer. And uh, what we did is we took this uh, 
bore gauge. We uh, set the bore gauge up to the uh, measurement on the micrometer. Now what we're going to do is we're going to see how much actual finished hone stock we have to take out to properly uh, do this cylinder. So I'm going to check this thing out here. Okay, we're going to take this bore gauge, we're going to put it in the cylinder, we're going to run it up and down. This is just this after bore. Usually I like to leave about three thou. We got just a little over, maybe about two, three tenths over. Running that baby down. See we got it's about it's about three thousand there. Three and a tenth. And maybe three and two tenths. And uh the roundness is pretty good. About three and three and two tenths. A little more down here, about four tenths. That's probably because of the down at the bottom where you got your rod opening, you get a little bit distortion down there sometime when you're boring. But we'll, the next step what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, we're going to attempt to uh, hone it to size with the rough stones. And once we get to size, we'll uh, okay. This is going to be the final step in our cylinder reconditioning. This is called a sun and hone precision honing machine. And I've had this machine since 1983. It's served me well. Super accurate. Uh, this is what we're going to use to, to uh, super finish these uh, cylinders. I'll try to keep this machine in fairly basic good shape. If you treat the machine good, it'll treat you good. But anyway, we're going to change the uh, to a uh, cylinder manual on this thing now. We're going to put the 100 stones on there, so I'm going to set that baby up, be back in a flash. By going too much farther in this machine, I just wanted to show you that all the, both all the, gate, all the gauges that are on this machine are intense. They measure intense, so you can get a pretty, uh, just about as accurate of a, of a fitment as you'd want to get. Here you've got uh, your uh, uh, indicator on the uh, bore gauge. This, this is precision AG300 gauge, which is used on uh, uh, rod reconditioning, wrist pin fitting, and so forth. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is a real lifesaver if you really want to do precision stuff. But anyway, I just wanted to show a couple of these things on this machine before I get going. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to install this uh, and... 600 cylinder home, so we gotta wipe everything out real good here. Take this sucker and put it off, offset to the holder, and you gotta turn it. Make sure it's lined up in the slot, and then you got a special wrench with sun and supply, so you don't over tighten the heck out of the thing when you're. You don't need much, just just to, you know, snug it up. Now, what we're going to have to do, this thing's got the finish stones in it right now, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take these stones out, and that's the way you loosen those two bolts, screws up, turn that baby and pull it out. Then we're going to take these stones out, set them aside in their own little pile, don't get them confused with anything else. Then over here I've got these roughing stones which are, they say right around 80 grit. So, that's what we're going to use to rough this baby out with. Uh, you can only put them in one way. They got a little X, a little X right here uh, at this leading edge of each hole. And you take the spline part of the, you can't put them, you could put them in, I imagine, backwards, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't work too good. But you always put them in like that. Then you take this baby and you put it back in there, like that. Then we're going to set our cylinder up on there. And I'll get back. i got to show you this. I made a special little uh, holding device for, this, for, for different types of cylinders. And we'll, we'll show you that. Okay, the, the first thing I'm going to do before I get started cutting on here is I got this. 
I don't know if you can see this, but I got the pressure. This is the uh, pressure setting for how much pressure you're going to have on your cut. And I usually like to run in rough right around a three. So we got that set. Then I want to make sure that my oilers are going to be pointing at the right place and the proper flow oil. So I'm going to have to set that the oilers up. Turn the oil main supply on and have the oil pointed down because it's going to damage usually a lot of air in there that can't be running for a while. As a matter of fact, it's one that a lot. I don't want that stuff splash, splashing too much. I'll let the oil run for a little while and get the oil, oil out of the system. A couple of times I had a line facing right towards my facial area and I wasn't too good. Anyway, set the back line up. Back part of the and the front will come up right up to the front. A little too. The thing is going. I'm going to turn the wall on any of now. There's a back. I'm going to do is I'm going to set this thing up for proper amount of uh, meat that uh, should be taken out. Now I got about three. I'm going to I'm putting my foot on the pedal now and watch that gauge. It's going to go up to about six, but that's going to probably be diminished pretty quick due to the fact of stoneware and metal being taken off. So it'll probably go down real quick. But anyway. Get going. I'll fire up the steam. Let's take a first pass. Here we go. Okay, what we're going to do here 
is we're going to take and put those finish stones back on. So we got to take the roughs off. We're already to size, so that's that's one step in the right direction. We're taking, you know, put their stones, make sure that they always put them in the X with the splines going towards the inside. Otherwise, you could be in hot water. Okay, here's your, and the, the holes are different width on the on the, uh, the guide shoes. Where this is a guide shoe, and the uh, the actual um, stones have got uh, narrow width, so you can't screw up there. So we're just gonna put this thing baby back on here. You can get that baby, get that cylinder up there. See, open that baby up, tighten it down. It's just rough. Because you're gonna, like I said before, you're gonna put the uh, amount of feed, that's what it is, amount of feed on the cylinder. So you put your foot on the pedal and you I'm not going to show you the gauge, but the gauge is moving quite a bit, so I'm going to have to take them back off. So, you know, we're running about maybe 4,000, 3,500 to 4,000 clearance on these. So, I'm going to give, I'm going to set this gauge you know, somewhere around 5. Now, this gauge is going to go down pretty quick. And then I'm going to, I'm going to put my pressure to about 2.5. Okay, now. We'll take we'll turn the machine on. Coolant's off. I mean the uh, yeah. Oil. Turn the machine's on. We'll turn our, our oil back on. And away we go. See, it sounds a lot, you know. Ooh, what are you? Ooh. We're just both stroking the city back and forth. Trying to keep it fairly even. Don't go with the oil and back and forth. Same thing, too much. You want it over the paper barrel, too. Get a little bit in the middle and back and front. Take this baby off. Get off. My board goes in there. Now I'm running. Yeah, about. About a thousand. Half thousand to the bottom of the thousand. The top got about a about a half inch, half thousand paper. So you can sit and run through that. Yeah. And then we're more off the back side. So if you turn up on our feet a little bit, that thing went down to about four and a half, five thousand. Good. About one and a tenth on the top. About one and two tenths on the bottom. So, a little bit more. Coulton will be about what I want. I want to get like about, I'm probably running about four thousand. Okay, we just uh, finished uh, doing the finished hole on this cylinder. Right now, just sitting just about where we want to, right around, oh, just a hair under four, four thousandths all the way through. So, that'll finish this aspect of the uh, holding the cylinders. And again, I don't know if you can really see, but the finish is pretty, pretty desirable. So, we'll, we'll get back onto some other aspects down the line. Okay, what we're looking at is, is, uh, we're, we're doing a mock mock installation of the, the barrels. We got the flywheels in the in the crankcases, and we got this thing set up so we can check the clearance. As you can see, those two pistons are just just about just about hitting each other right there. So we're, I'd like to see about those oh, sixty to eighty thousand clearance between there. Another thing, we got to check. We look like we we've, we've got adequate flywheel to. Uh, piston clearance, so next thing we want to look at is our rod case. Rod to case, looks like we got adequate, but the only thing I'm worried about is our rod to cylinder clearance, so I'm going to give that a little 
confirm. So you know it's not hitting. I want to have at least at least 60 on that. And I want to, and that front rod, I don't like that. It's not hitting, but as you can see, it's pretty close. So I'm going to be giving that thing some clearance also. Now we get up here, clicked on there, four and three quarters strokes. Pretty, pretty heavy, a lot of travel there. Pistons are coming right up above. I wanted to get some lower compression pistons. These are 901s, which is as low as I can get. So I'm gonna, I might wind up running some thicker head gaskets. These, these pistons are popping up. They're pretty stinking good. And anyway, the, well, the main thing that we got to do here, we got to check our piston to piston clearance, our rod to case clearance, our rod to barrel clearance in piston to plywood clearance, and making sure the pistons are not overextending out of the top of the cylinders. So we'll get back to you. I'm going to have to do some machining on the pistons and machining on the cylinder and machining on the front of the case. We'll, we'll get back on this thing when we go to check it after I did the uh, machining. I have to get in there and do something. I'd like to give it at least, uh, uh, I like to get, yeah, I'd be, I'd be comfortable right between those two pistons with about 80, 60 to 80, so that's what we're going to shoot for. And we got to get that clearance in that rear rod, and we'll be, we'll be pretty good shape. I'll get back with you a little. And here we are with the crankcase uh, in the Miller machine. We're up on a dog on uh, angle plate and uh, we're getting ready to uh, give this thing a little bit more clearance so uh, that's what we're going to be doing jump a few steps there I didn't really show you but what I did do is I just put the Timken bearings on the flywheel. What I normally do is I take and take, first I measure out the shaft, measure out the race, make sure it's not any more than a thou and a half interference fit and then I heat the bearings up to about 200 degrees and then I drop them on. They're usually expand enough to drop them off. Be very careful and uh, I just Check the end play on these bearings, and we've got about a thou and a half end play, so we're doing all right there. Next thing to do, be to do is to put right hand case out and make sure that everything turns free. Okay, as you can see, we have got a little bit more progress on this engine. I went and uh, some little right hand case on that thing and we've got our breather gear in there, we got our pinion gear and our oil pump drive gear and uh, there's the oil pump itself on there I myself have always been a little bit partial to a cast iron pump you know S&S &S and there's some other aftermarket outfits that got the higher volume pump out I've had this particular engine since 1969 and it's had quite a few, I know, I figure it probably got at least 250, 300,000 miles on it. And uh, the pump's been holding up just fine. I've never had any major problems with this engine. And now it's going for 92 inch. I'm really excited. As you can see, here's your uh, new old lowered uh, oil return hole. The front and the rear, you got come back, you know, through the hole in the cylinder down and through the, the crankcase and then exit out this hole through the barrel and back into the case. It seems to be pretty satisfactory. Not only that, I did, one thing I did want to show you, I got a hold of these 12 point um, 
nuts for the crankcases. They're a lot stronger. You can get a lot better torque on your cases with these. I wish I knew where to get them. Just having to pick them up where I was working at. But they're, they're coming out pretty good. You know, we'll whip this thing around, as you can see. There's your uh, breather cavity there. A little dark there. But, uh, yeah, I wish there was a little more light. As you can see that we're lining up pretty darn good here. So, we'll get back with you as we do a little bit more, but I think this engine's coming alive pretty good. Let's, let's swing around here. The other side. I'm proud of that little stainless steel bowl I made for the hold down. There's our Timken. All in all, it's looking pretty proud. Okay, we're getting real close to putting this cam cover on now. I just previously, uh, I had to do some work. I had to make some new uh, locating dial pins. These are the dial pins that, I, that were in there. More or less got narrowed up taking them out so I could put the case on the Miller machine. But we've, I'd already put the cam cover on. I checked my clearances, figured in the compression of the gasket. And I had to put like a 5,000 shim behind this spacer for the idler gear. The distributor gear was just about 1,000 before becoming max. But I don't want to like get too close on the clearances on that. And then, then you get your, uh, I don't want to have any danger of seizing up on the case. You know, on the case, the breather gear uh, was pretty ideal as far as clearances went on that. So. The camshaft was plenty adequate, but we'll, we'll get back. Okay, now we got our cam cover on, we got our lifter stools on, front and rear, and uh, we're getting ready to put the cylinders on this baby. And we got the we got the Ford's Pistons 2900 series with the uh, Teflon wrist pin buttons. So. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to make sure that the, uh, the ring gap is proper for this thing. So I'm going to check this thing, make sure that we got at least, I'd like to see at least uh, 12 thousandths. I don't know if you can see on this thing what we got, but uh, yeah, 12 thousandths. And we've got at least 12 thousandths on that thing. So I'm, I'm happy about that. As a matter of fact, this 15,000 trailer gauge here, we put that in there and it's just a little, little bit snug. It won't quite, quite go all the way in there. So, I feel, I feel real, uh, really good about that. So the next thing you do is I make sure all my rings have got proper gap. Your oil rings can have, they say 10 to 40. I had about 25 ring gap on those and you got, that's a three piece rail type uh, oil ring which is these little jobs right down here. Then you get the let me see if I can get those babies out. You got your expander and then you got your your little thin rail jobs here. There's two of them to go with each expander. But uh, Get back with you on that. Okay, we got the rear cylinder on now. The thing. We're ready to put the front on. As you can see, we got those uh, big bore uh, base nuts on there, which are a little deceiving because we don't really have the big bore barrels on there. But that's the only thing I had laying around at the time, so <clears throat> that's what I got on there. But anyway, we're, we're getting progress here. We'll uh, see to put that front piston and barrel on. Now we got both front and rear cylinders on this thing, so we're we're uh, getting pretty good progress here. As you can see, that front piston is uh, you know, sitting up there pretty good. Matter of fact, it's right up to the top of that that heat lamp. So I'm gonna have to check. Clearance between the 
the actual cylinder head in that uh, squish area part of the piston which is right here on the outskirts of that piston. So check that. But as you can see, right on the piston going down in there a long way. Coming up pretty good. Oops, slipped off that sucker. There we go. Work them rings in a little bit. thing I'm going to be doing on this engine is I'm going to have to get these heads finished off. So I, did, I showed you in an earlier sequence about putting seats in those heads and I'm going to have to finish up doing the valve job and setting up the rockers and putting those heads together and getting them on this engine. I want to get this doggone thing fired up. Time is is uh, dwindling away. This doggone Turk hasn't been running in seven years so I'm just going to have to get on the ball and get this thing going. Yeah, here's some pictures of some of the old motors that I've either owned or worked on. That's, that's a picture of some of the uh, inner workings of a 1917 JD Harley twin that I had. And uh, there's your, uh, that's about a 1941-45 I was working on. Some more pictures of there it is completed. It's a pretty nice looking motor. We get down here, it's an old pan bottom. Back there it was when I got it. And it's a, that's an old 69, or that's a 66 uh, Sportster XL. Various pictures of that in different construction. Here's a uh, 57 pan head right there, complete. There's another various steps. There's probably one of the, I think it's a 90 inch shovel head that I built. The shovel heads all look pretty much the same. There's the Abbey Lucian motor right there. That's a pretty pretty good running motor I did for a guy in Fremont. With a big cam in it and shit and did a little bit of head work. That thing honked on S&S car. Fat Bob, I mean the soft tail bike is not my idea of anything it's going to be potential to go fast because it's so heavy. But anyway, it did when I got through with it. And then here shows how I'm dropping a uh, race in on that pan head. Here's a set of shovel heads. Yeah. Here's a pan head. And then there shows the inner workings of them. Get a 76 shovel head just showing us get a four and a half stroke in there and a little action folder this is me and a guy I used to work with at Sunnyvale going down to 680 I think it's near Livermore somewhere and here's a picture of me and a our day to Sunnyvale on some homemade thing somebody built with an engine that we sold them and 68 shovel there you know, picture of me, I'm old, old 250 BSA shit. That's back in about 1964, I think it was. And there's another 68 shovel. There's a picture of me back, shit, that must have been back in 74, somewhere around there. Sitting on that old thing that that guy made with a new engine. Some of the bikes in the shop. A picture of a knucklehead, that was also a motor that I built over at Sunnyvale, but it was a pretty good streamer. There's a picture of me when I was a little wiped out in my garage one night. Another picture of that, that old knuckle. And then you get over here. Here's a picture of me when I was really zonkled out. I was in my own garage. I forgot who it was. I shot that picture, but we were really gassed. There's my old dummy, I think it's about a, basically a 51, 49 to 51 panhead engine, I just, you know, getting 
whatever spare parts I can get because the cases are really sort of <coughs> junketated, but we could probably fix it up someday. But I just want to have a complete pan one of these days so I can have something to look back on, tell all my, my nephews and shit what's going on. That's what we got there. My head's finished and my pan head's going on my motor. And I sort of got past doing a, I was going to get a little detailed thing on doing a valve job, but I'll do that down the lines, you know, that will be down the line when I get a little bit more time, but anyway, there's one of the heads that's going to go on my bike, and, uh, now, believe it or not, this is a picture of me back in 1959, I think it was, my, uh, 1956 650 BSA doing a little wheelie. Matter of fact, right where I'm doing that is in Palo Alto out there. Where, uh, I think Gus Mozart's Volkswagen was built, and also Ming's Restaurant right in the corner there. So that's, that's a little bit of history, right? Okay, now we're getting a lot closer on this motor. We got the front head on there, and the uh, rest of the engine is pretty much together. So all we're really doing is we're waiting. We got to get that rear head put together. You know, we got the rear head on as well. It's getting quite a bit closer now. So, next step, we're going to put the rest of that engine together and hopefully get that baby in that frame as soon as we can. Beat the odds. got a uh, right hand 80 inch Harley flywheel which is going in a pan head and we're uh, we just finished balancing this flywheel to 58 percent 58 percent seems to work out pretty good on the on the regular stock Harley flywheels usually on uh, more lighter flywheels like the S&S &S, we uh, more or less stick with S&S &S says it's 60 percent on the flywheels but when you get through the flywheel like this, this thing, this flywheel should stay stationary, you know, at any point, in any place you put it. I mean, it shouldn't move. And that's what we got. You know, you can take that sucker and go 180 and go any degree you want, and that thing is totally, you know, balanced. And as you can see, these are the new holes I had on the flywheel, and I got through with it. You know, we did have this thing does have S&S &S, um, 8 to 1 pistons in it which are a little bit heavier than even the stock pistons that we were running in this thing so that, that accounts for a little bit of these extra holes although the factory was a little lax in some of their balancing before but uh, try to get a little bit of insight on the, the proper procedure down the line here I just wanted to let you let you see this thing And now here's a, uh, here's a left hand flywheel out of a 1982, 83 vintage 80 inch motor. And, which, and, and we, we got this thing set up for like 58% on the bob weight as you can see. Now the interesting thing about it is this flywheel here is heavy on the crank pin side. So it's going to go down to the crank pin. It's pretty, pretty heavy so we're going to have to we're going to take some weight out there. Now the off, the right hand flywheel was heavy, you know, towards the um, the uh, uh, opposite, right in here in this webbing. So it indicates to me that we have a little bit of a vibrating motor, which sort of indicated to me because of uh, the way the shafts looked and the way the flywheels were uh, wearing and the tapers. So we'll get back on this thing in a second. Okay, here we've got a uh, front head off of a 76 shovel head. We're just getting ready to set this up on the mill. We're going to uh, do a little bit of a, a uh, 
resurfacing the job on the head since his head is pretty doggone shit. As you can clearly see, this head is pretty doggone pitted. You got a lot of pits all over the surface. And uh, it's a two-fold situation on this head because this head was sort of like a one of those poor, fairly porous cast heads. And I think the second reason that we've got all this is because the head was allowed to run loose, therefore we're getting a little bit of, well, I'd say a lot of leakage between the head gasket and the, and the head, and there's a lot of heat produced in there, plus movement, and it tended to, you know, make those <clears throat> pores in the head quite a bit deeper. So what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to uh, resurface this head here. And here we are with uh, here we are with the uh, head clapped to the uh, table in a proper fashion. What we want to do is try to keep these clamps as level as we can. We don't we want to have it sloping towards the object we're clamping down, not away. So we get a little bit of we get more the most of the downward force on the the item that we're clamping. And we got these precision parallels underneath the head, you know, making sure that. We take a, a um, I take a 1,000 feeler gauge, and I uh, try to you know check underneath all the surfaces of the head. They're they're resting on the uh, parallels, making sure that uh, that feeler gauge will not go uh, in any place within uh, the uh, head and the parallel. So uh, we got our indicator on there where you know. We just indicate this head in, and this head seems to be uh, about ten thousandths, you know, out of being totally flat. There's a couple, with all these pits in this head, and this thing not being totally flat, we're, we're doing this thing a good service to uh, re, uh, resurface it. But we'll, we'll get back to you in a, in a little while here. Okay, here's, here's what we're doing, is we're, we're taking a second, uh, pass on uh, uh, searching his head. Hopefully this will be the last rub pass and then we can uh, take the uh, final finish cut. We're using a uh, boring head with a uh, facing carbide cutter on there. It seems to uh, work out pretty good. We've got to also we've got to cut through these, these uh, steel inserts. Except the head bolts, and sometimes that sort of upsets the, the uh, flow when you're going through the uh, movement, and then the uh, steel at the same time.
shit. Right hand seems like it's pretty good. Yeah, he does it. Okay, you can get my bald head now. Get over here, let's see better. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you see shadows if you're. Yeah. Here. It'll blind you. <laughs> It'll blind you. <laughs> yeah. There he is. Yeah. yeah. My boy. <laughs> Oh, that's a good Ford. Yeah, hey, another one. Ford. Ford. Yeah, I know. Well, I used to see that Ford, man. It's got spotlight on over there. Give us a ride. There you go. Yeah, get him a sign. Yeah. <laughs> cool, brother. Just right there. It's not a good mission to be able to just promise to take care of the citation. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, no, it's not the expensive one. You're just being cited for modified and drug. Not the speeding, okay? What about the new year? Is this going to drive Pardon me? Is it possible to get excessive loaded? Someone I can sign it up for that. Oh, yes, sir. No. <laughs> I just asked. I just asked. Now I'm See, you know the difference yeah. now, yeah. huh? Yeah, that's, that's the I already yeah. talked to her about. Yes, yeah, sir. Cool. I just asked. I absolutely appreciate that. that was you nice. have a nice yeah, day, sir. okay? Don't bring a drive like you do now. Okay? Have a nice day. Nice evening. Huh? You're not getting me. I'm bald. Hey, that'll bald it. Got it. All right. Take care, bro. Take it easy, guys. You too, Bill. We got here the first step of, for me on machining of this transmission case. What I'm going to attempt to do is, what I want to do is, uh, I want to pin this uh, shift shaft in there so we got uh, less chance of the shaft getting loose and moving around and uh, causing, uh, usually in most cases, a breakage where it's pivoted pointed at this point right here. There's the basic setup. Now I got a little jack underneath the case. I'm going to take this sucker. I've already indicated the case. In it's looking pretty good. So the next step is we're gonna we're gonna machine this sucker out. So bear with me. We gotta fix this little boo boo up here. Somebody did some other shop, and I think there's still some busted off metal. I'm gonna have to get a dual angle setup on this, but we'll we'll get it. Anyway, we'll we'll get back on you on that.
Okay, what we got here now is uh, we got the uh, setup for uh, machining this uh, compound angle on the uh, transmission geometer uh, drive. Now I've already got the angle set up, and I'm using two. Uh, you know, here's my main angle plate, and I got a uh, auxiliary uh, angle plate here to get the other uh, angle. But anyway, what I've already indicated this thing in, yeah, and I'm gonna try to, you know, machine this hole. There's a broken off bolt in there. Somebody messed this hole up. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is machining a good hole in there and putting an insert in there and dialing the, the true center back. So anyway, there, there's basically the setup here, and uh, we're gonna get on with that pretty stinking soon now. Okay, I didn't really get a chance to show you the actual uh, machining of this uh, uh, speedometer drive uh, locating hole here, but here's the uh, finished product. Came out pretty good. What I did is I took a piece of aircraft aluminum. I uh, went and bored this hole out. First, first of all, I had a pain in the ass because I had to get a bunch of broken tap and drill out of there, and that was a pain in the ass with a carbide grinder. Then I took and uh, uh, machined this thing out, got my hole diameter. We wound up putting a 3 8 plug in there made out of aircraft aluminum. And that was uh, threaded in there partially. And the last 30% was more or less a press because I machined this plug to where it pressed in at the last few revolutions. And then I uh, went located the hole for the drive, drilled and tapped it, and it uh, come out pretty good. Here's, here's a speedometer drive right here, and as you can see, we're pretty nuts on. The guy that owns this transmission now is a, is a guy that I work with over at this place, and his, his name's Hemi Rankin, and uh, I think he got a slightly boogified transmission here. But we're trying to straighten this thing out. Most of the gears were messed up in it. Now there's also on the bottom, as you can see, this stud here was pulling out. So I'm gonna have to do some work on that. The, um, a lot of times that, that stud there will go because that's where a lot of the torque is. Force on there's a stud right here. And, uh, I'm gonna have to probably go an oversized stud on that or you know whatever I fix it I'm gonna have to do it do it right but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll get back on that uh, later on later okay <clears throat> I'd already taken all the studs out they can clean the threads. The threads are good. I went and put them in. I had this this uh, Loctite that I got from a uh, place where I used to work, which was up to Navy Mill Specs. I put that stuff in there, and them studs ain't going to go anywhere. But then what we do, we want to make sure these studs ain't going to leak, because they, they have a tendency of leaking sometimes. So we sealed up these studs on the inside, and I'm using this, you know, <clears throat> special uh, uh, silver or aluminum type uh, silicon bond. Seems to work pretty good. I haven't had any problems with it. But anyway, we got, <clears throat> we've already taken this main drive seal. We put the cork that we put in there and we got this double up seal. Here's, here's a cork that goes behind that seal. And then here's the uh, the uh, seal driver, spacer, the hat, you call it, that goes, you know, in the middle there. And I'd taken, I'd pressed that, that seal in. And I've also got some of that sealer, you know, between the case and the seal. And I put a little, you know, extra around the outer perimeter of the seal in the case. 
to ensure that we don't get any leaking through there. Now what we're going to do, we've already got, we've already got the uh, race fitted. Well, I didn't do it. Somebody else did. Hopefully that will be all right. I checked the clearances and the clearances are good. So we're going to, we're going to put the high gear in there right now. There we go. That high gear is in there. Now we're ready to go on. Looking pretty good. Okay, now <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take, we already put the uh, first, second gear cluster on the main shaft. We got our new ball bearing in the in a bearing carrier. Now this particular bearing was a little bit on the loose side fit in this in this carrier, so we were extra ensured that the thing wouldn't be spinning or doing anything funny. We uh, put some uh, bearing mount Loctite in there. Now we put this load nut on here, bearing nut. This thing is gonna. Always have this little uh, raised part facing to the outside. And then, uh, <clears throat> very important that we torque this to the proper torque specs. The uh, torque specs is 50 to 60 foot pounds on this particular nut. There we go, it's 60 foot pounds right there. We gotta make very careful that when we bend these lock lock tabs over that we don't injure the um, the cover to the bearing. This is keep the, some of the crap from the kicker bushing material to getting into the bearing. And on the other side of the bearing, there's also a seal. We don't want any of the transmission crap to get in there either. So we're gonna make sure we bend the tabs over very carefully without hurting the cover. Usually, uh, yeah very uh, narrow uh, tools such as a uh, gasket scraper will suffice in getting under there and bend that tab up. And once you bend that tab up and get that lip going, then you can knock that thing over. Where in this case we already oops, the focus. We already bent this tab over. Now you don't have to bend every tab over. We're not going to bend every tab over, but the ones that are pretty close to the flats, we will. That nut's not going to go anywhere. Being the fact we did use some Loctite on it. Okay, what we're going to do now, we're going to have to um, put this. We already got the uh, play on our third gear set, so we're gonna we're gonna attempt to put this tranny together. Now, first we take put the shaft in the case and take we shove first our third gear on there. The uh, third gear spacing ring, spacer, and then the clip, container clip, then. Uh, the uh, shift dog or shift clutch. Now you always want to make sure that these things, when they say, like they'll either say AP4 or high gear on a Harley, and you always want to have that towards high gear, which is right here. So what we're going to do, is put this baby together, get that baby in there. Okay, I'm going to shove all this crap in there right now. Let's see that gear on there, slide all that crap over there like that, let's see, take this, let's see, get this spacer on there, and then we'll have to get some I go over and get my little pickos. 
But anyway, the main thing is you want to, when you put this clippy on here, you don't want to spring it. So you start out at one, one portion of this thing, you turn the shaft, take your little, you know, it's just a little uh, dentist type pick, so whatever you want to say. Just work this clip on there nice and gently. You don't want to, you know, the, you know you, with, with anything, you don't want to spring the thing. You spring that clip, man. You're 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 in big trouble, man. When that uh, third gear wants to come off. But anyway, got that clip on there. Once I get that clip on there, then I take dog, push it up against clip, and you should hear it pop in there. When it, here we go. There. Hear that pop? That snap? Okay. There we go. We got we got the clippy dippy in there now. Okay, now these things, these uh, uh, bearing retainers, have got a little slight press fit in the case. So I like to get them to where I'm just sort of push them into our hand. All I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this case up. It's a little bit. It's, it's not too much. It's a little bit. See that thing popped right in there. See, just slippity dippity right in there. Now that's the way you want to do it. Every dog on time. Slippity dippity do pooped. I usually like to even, you know, I'll I'll let this thing sort of sit while it's cooling. You know, on something, so it doesn't swell out. Then, let me see. I got my retainer plate here. Put that, let me see. Put that old retainer plate on. A little retainer plate. Let's see. It's gonna go right like that. See right up here. You've got a um, little cutout here where the uh, the um, oil slinger goes. Let me get let me get my four screw bolts. And we'll start this screw balloon on bound here to hold this thing in place. I gotta get me an oil slinger. Mr. Hemi Rankin, he didn't supply a slinger, so he said that he's got one coming in. I'm either gonna have to get a slinger or make one and normally finally assembly I like to put a little bit of lock and tighten them on them. It's called lock and tighten them on them, uh, these screw bows. But I'm just gonna put a little bit of pressure on this. Little bit of pressure on there. 
make sure that thing settles. Now hopefully, whoever put that race in this case, and he got a fairly decent uh, alignment there, I'm sure he did. It was done over at Jim Carr's shop called Chino's. I imagine if he did it, it's probably pretty reasonably good. Tighten that baby up. Just want to get a little holding power here. There. That's very important that these, these screws don't get over tightened. They only have about a about an eight to ten pound foot pound. Now this looks pretty stinking good, you know. Free, pretty free turning shaft, high gear turns good. It's looking all right. I'm, I'm not complaining. But uh, we've got to get the rest of this transmission going here pretty soon. We'll, we'll, we'll get back with you. Okay, what we got here is we uh, just put this um, early style speedometer drive gear onto a um, newer style uh, uh, counter shaft cluster gear and we're checking alignment here on the, the lathe. Uh, we're a little off. We can't really have that. I like to get them within. These gears don't have to be as close as some other gears. We'd like to see them a lot closer than that. So we're going to dial this baby in. we got something that's runnable for us. Okay, we got this baby dialed in about as close as I'm going to look to get it dialed in. And I wasn't even expecting that close. Now, you don't get speedometer drives like that all every day. But anyway, it's ought to be a pretty stinking good transmission when we get through this sucker. Okay, now what we're doing here is uh, we're um, loading our counter shaft cluster gear with the needle bearings. And you've got to make sure that when you load these things up that you uh, don't forget to put this steel hardened washer, thrust washer in here. Because if you don't, you're going to have some big problems. The bearings are going to be riding up against that shirt clip. It's going to turn into instant shit. But anyway. But I want, the first thing I want to do, I get stuck on my finger. First thing I want to do is get this counter shaft gear set up and then, you know, put it in the transmission with a, you know, whatever spacer I can get to fit in there, as long as we got clearance, so we can actually check, we can actually check our end play. And we don't put no, you know, we don't put no first gear on there or anything. A lot of guys put first gear on there and think that they're checking the end plate between that and the other side of the case. But that's not, that's not true. Oh, I'm going to give me a paper towel, wipe my finger off. But... What we want to do is get these bearings loaded in there. I've had pretty good luck with most of the bearing sets I get off of you. Bang, Gary Bang. I've already checked these bearings out, and these are these are standard bearings. So we're going to load these babies in there.
and then after we get the bearing loaded, we'll, we'll be putting this, the cluster gear in the case and checking actual end play, and then we'll adjust from, from there. Okay, now here's the way I like to uh, put these suckers in here. We got this end, also we got this end washer, you got to make sure you put that in, right? What I like to do is have the transmission uh, shaft in a vertical position. Okay, then I, I, I pop the counter in there like that. And then I, I take my counter shaft shaft and I come up from the bottom. Okay, see it's we're sliding in there pretty easily. Don't have to worry about jaggle dates and some bearings. I got I got 58 thousand spacer, which is a pretty pretty small spacer. Put that baby up in there, and you can see it. Okay, jaggle it around. Okay, the shafts the shaft is through. Okay, so I can take this actually take this shaft out. I got to get me a nut to hold that shaft in place. Darn shaft back in. Okay, the shaft's in. Just putting a nut up here to hold hold this baby in place. You can try to check what basic end play we've got in here. Now you can see we've got a fair amount of end play right now. We got the 58,000th washer in there. So if you really want to do it super trick. You know, you can put an indicator in there, but a feeler gauge will suffice in this particular case. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take our feeler gauge and just check and see how much play we actually got in that there. Okay, we, we determined that uh, we had somewhere we had a 50,000 spacer to start off in there, and we had pretty close to 50,000 clearance. So what we did is I took that that 50,000 spacer out, and we put a 100,000 spacer in there. Now we're checking down. We we got 4,000 clearance. 4,000. Here's a 4,000 filler gauge. Get a little bit of drag. So what available uh, spacers are available? Ideally, I'd like to have you know a right around 10,000 or whatever, eight to ten. I really don't want to go any tighter on 10,000 seems to be the happy figure for not getting too tight and seasoned up so so anyway we just happen to have a 90,000 spacer here so that will put us pretty close to the ballpark so right around 10,000 so that's what we're going to do we're going to take this 90,000 spacer put it in there see right now we're you know it's 4,000 so we'll have just about what we want with that 90,000 Okay, we always want to double check and make sure that when we mic these things out that we're properly reading the mic and everything's just happy dundy. Anyway, here's this this wa this watcher here, as you can see, is definitely ninety thousand. We see it on the counter, we see it up here on the thimble. So we are doing okay as far as that goes. Now what we wanna do, we wanna take this other washer out of here. Run that shaft down. We can grab the washer with our hand very easily. That's one thing that's really neat. If you had first gear on there and all that blonky blonky, you wouldn't be able to do it. Now what we do is just take pop this baby in there. See, get that baby. Okay, it's lined up, it's in there. This makes it a hell of a lot easier. Most of these guys seem struggling with first gear in there. It's a bunch of hogwash. See, now we got more of what we wanted to shoot for. So we'll uh, 
I'll just shoot through some of these fielder gauges and see what we got and see what we come up with. Five, ten, seven, whatever. Okay. Here's what we got. Yeah, twelve thousands will fit in there. Little bit of play, ninety. So what we want to do is see if we can shuffle through and find like a say a ninety-two thousand spacer or whatever. Okay, we finally, finally found the right uh, spacer, the truss washer, whatever you want to call it, compounded thing. But uh, just check that baby for uh, proper uh, in play and. Uh, Seem to do the trick there. We got a 10,000 fuel gauge right here. That baby in there, we just got just just a hair ass drag there, so that's what we want. So we're gonna move on to uh, doing the rest of the cluster here real shortly on it. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna attempt to set up a uh, the end play on uh, uh, second gear uh, on the uh, counter shaft. And one thing that I'm uh, that I like to tell people to watch out for is when you're setting up the end play, you're you're setting up the end play between the two faces of the gear, between this face and this face, and you got a washer here and then a circlip. Or a snap ring, spiral lock, whatever you want to call it. In some instances, this bushing will actually be wider than the distance between the two surfaces of this gear. So, in that case, either you do something to the bushing, which I'm going to do now, or you try to find a suitable bushing that's smaller or narrower, you know, between the gear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this old bushing on the lathe and I'm going to turn the baby down and give me a little bit of uh, clearance. I'm going to turn it down at least five thousandths under the, the surface of these gear. Are you with me on that? Okay, we do have the counter shaft installed in there. We just put the uh, first, second gear shift clutch in there and low gear, proper bushing. Now, when you want to check up actual first gear play, you got to take this counter shaft and you go up against the uh, kicker side, that thrust washer, and you're going to be checking between the thrust washer and first gear. Now, you got like you're supposed to have like they say four to twelve where we're sitting right about ten right here so I'm happy with that and I'm, there's not much more you can do about that and everything else looks pretty ship shape so we're we're getting about where we want to be the Hemi's transmission will be duck soup okay now we're we're at the uh, all important of doing one of these transmissions. Now I just wanted to show you this is for setting the uh, shift fork spacing on the transmissions on the three speeds, reverse, and the four speed hand shift, foot shift transmissions until you get to the saucer top. Then you've got a different setting fixture. But anyway, this is the basic fixture for setting these things. What you want to do, you want to get these suckers in your neutral positions which this is going to be for your 
high gear, I mean your, uh, excuse me, your low gear setting. So you want to get in a, in that neutral track. You got a pin which is roughly three eighths pin which is going to set that thing. Then I'm going to move this sucker over to the third gear high gear track. You get these little sun screws loosen up. See, these things can flip flop any old which flippy floppy way they want to flip flop. We put that old pin poppy in there. Make sure that we got a, a fairly smooth flow through there. Then so we got these things set. Take that baby off of that baby. We'll set that that aside. Top. Then we'll take and we'll put this baby up onto the transmission case itself. Okay. Making sure our rollers are in there and all that trick stuff. Okay. Now we want to we want to measure in here. We want to make sure that we we got proper clearance between our shift clutch uh, surfaces on the gears and the actual clutch itself. We're going to look. We're going to set up for third and fourth gear spacing also. So anyway, you get to determine whether we've got the proper spacing here or not. Visually it looks like we're we're off. Looks like a bunch on high gear. Maybe like you got about 150 plus on between fourth and clutch, so we're gonna have to do some spacing. Now I've got some actual spacing tools which I made which have got different thicknesses which I can check this and we'll we'll uh, try and get into that real soon here. Now, I don't know how close you can see that that uh, high gear third dock but uh, what we want to do is we want to get the close possible of a pretty much central spacing in the dock and I've already measured the thing and it's within five thousandths of being true center. And we come over here to to our um, first second chip clutch. And we're we're about as close as we can get on that. We're we're sitting within a, about five on that also. So so far we're we're looking about what we want to look as far as um that's a really good shift. That looks pretty good. There's a straight down shot on that, baby. That's looking pretty stinking good, that's all I can say. When we do put these uh, final assembly on these ship forks together, we want to make sure that we do have, you know, new new locks. We want to make sure that we put final when we finally get what we want. We got a new locks, none of this, you know, reused lock bullshit. We have nice fresh tabs. Make sure we set these babies up right. Turned out this thing was pretty tended to favor third gear by about forty thousand, so we had to have a pretty good washer stack behind that shift fork to carry it more towards fourth 
this actually put us within a 5 thousandths variance you know, from being centered when we got through. So I was happy with that. This fork here uh, was actually, you know, within about the same range, four to five thousandths, you know, when we got through. One thing I did want to say, I did have a little bit of problem with this, with this shifter lid. The thing wound up having about 15, 16 thousandths end play. So uh, that was one problem. Another problem when I pulled this thing apart, you had your little, uh, you know, uh, uh, locating screw. And this thing is busted. You know, that, that was to hold the, the uh, drum shaft in. And evidently, the last turd face to put this thing together, they, when they put this shaft in through the drum, they uh, went in too far, and this doggone pin actually wound up tightening down on the actual. Uh, uh, shaft part of the, of the not not the groove and it wound up breaking the pin and the pin was sitting in there cocked and had a hell of a time getting that out so I wound up making a new one of these you know when I got through with it, it you know this is what they look like it's a whole one there but anyway the drum there's a little sleeve that goes in this drum and the sleeve is loose and I had to repair that and bush that sleeve up plus I had to shim I had to make some shims out of some, you know, shim stock. I got about four thousand in play right now, which is which is plenty good. So, uh, so I'm I'm <clears throat> really really happy with the way this baby's coming out. So, well, we'll get back with you later. Okay, one thing that I did want to let you know while I'm here, most of these shift tops that I've seen, people put them together and they don't put this little little uh, uh, cork uh, washer, I mean not cork, leather washer, it goes here between the shift lever and the case. This one didn't have it in there and I'm sure that this ain't the last one. But I just want to let you know, just, just for reference, the sucker is going to work hunky door now man, hunky donkey door. Okay, as you can see, we've got the kicker cover here, and we've got sort of a rough situation with this. This kicker cover has got a couple of cracks. I don't know if you can really see it, but there is a. Let me see if I can get in there somehow with my macro on my camera. Just, just hold on a second. Bear with me. We'll, we'll get in there. Yeah, you can, as you can see, we got a crack right in here. Let me see if we can get some light on that sucker. Yeah, it's about. Well, you can you can see it. Pretty prevalent right there. And we got another. We got another crack here. But anyhow. to uh, try and save this thing. What we've got, we've got one of the old kickers, you know, the solid shaft kicker assembly. And uh, the shaft, I mic the shaft out, it seems to be pretty round. It's been sort of like filed in and stuff by previous people that worked on this. And it's, it mics out roughly, uh, 738. Well, these the bushings that were in the case weren't really worn that much. They were about 750, 751. And uh, new set of bushings. They met my mic out about about 749, 748. And then when you press them in there, we'll get we'll shrink them down a little bit. But I'm going to try and uh, try and do what we can with what we got here. But the thing that really concerns me now, this will work. But evidently, the, the third face, it had this gear on this shaft, put this thing together, it had a, um, the lock tabs were all locked down, but the nut was a little loose. So we get a little bit of slop here. But I, I've seen them get by with this before. 
worst comes to worst, push comes to shove. But we really should eventually try and find a new shaft and perhaps possibly a gear. But we'll see what we can do with this right now. I, I don't know about that. It's a little rough, a little loose. But I'm going to put the bushings in there and see how the shaft fits first off. Then we'll, we'll deal with this situation a little later down the road. Okay, we just installed these uh, oil light uh, kitchen bushings and I'm going to show you some of them. Get a little bit of heat induced on those bushings and they actually uh, weep a little bit of oil on them. They hold oil and that bushing will actually uh, produce oil, that's what they call them, oil light bushings. But anyway, we got the kicker gear on the case, we got a little lash taken out of it, and uh, hopefully we're going to work. Really should get a new gear and a shaft eventually, but I think this will do the trick. Instead of the regular three prong, prong uh, lock tab, I use a two of the uh, uh, hard internal tooth lock washers back to back behind this nut and I also use some good uh, uh, sleeve retainer nut uh, stud retaining Loctite compound which with a little bit of heat uh, cures up pretty good and it's about the best shot this thing's got but uh, I think we're going to be doing alright you know we just put one of those uh, super nuts to hold a counter shaft sprocket on and uh, what I would like to do is make sure that that's, that nut is torqued with an appropriate torque wrench and not uh, not having an impact wrench applied to it because it's uh, counterproductive in a bunch of different ways you got a little bit of slop at all in these gears and when you tighten this nut up you're going to pull the gear this way which you're going to wind up taking the lash out of the gear so when the gear finally gets a little bit of pressure on it the gear is going to want to go back this way which is going to just ever so slightly you're going to loosen that nut up it's going to make that nut probably wind up coming coming up done but anyway I, I just torqued that thing down and put about 100 pounds torque on it so I don't think it's going to go anywhere make sure we got our silicon seal between the splines and the gear and the, and the the seal hat, seal drive hat, and you want to put a little bit of good lock liner on the nut to boot. So I think we're going to be doing pretty good. Okay, while I got that transmission done, there's a very few little steps that I neglected to tell you about, but I had to get this thing going. Okay. Emmy's going to be putting it in his 42 knuckle puckle face here pretty soon and it ought to be quite a little little show. I went and shimmed this clutch release arm up to minimal dimensions and I saved this kickstarter as good as I could. It should work. How long? I don't know. But we've got, uh, we've got the super nut on here which is actually, it's not a it's not a um, CCI one. We did have a CCI nut on there, but it was sort of self-destruct, turning into a piece of shit. Somewhere over here, where is it? Okay, over here. If you, let's see if we can get a shot here. Put the threads roll shit it in there. If you look in there, you're going to see a little fuzzy, little fuzzy peel, peel agent. Little thread, but that would be a pretty good little transmission for him. I've got the date on here just to see when he does get his shit together the doggone bike going this is Bill Bailey's yeah here we are we're setting up the angle and this uh, jig I got for doing the uh, little spark plug head. We got this uh, STD head in there. I'm just trying to let you see the basic setup. 
that I've got. So you're using two, two angle plates slung together. They're parallels underneath the head there. Right now we're just trying to get our one axis, our fore aft axis uh, dialed in. We already got the angle set up for the the actual uh, spark plug. It's going to be about 70 degrees. But anyway, we'll we'll get down the line here. See what goes on. Okay, here's a picture of a. Uh, one of those STD pan heads, with, it's just got a single spark plug. And they sort of favor the spark plug. You want to favor it towards the intake, which seems to be a good uh, place to have it if you want to get the maximum benefit of your spark. Now, over here is a, this is the uh, rear head that I just finished. And I put that uh, spark plug on the opposite side. And both of them plugs are sitting pretty much where they want them. You're up uh, to, because of the fact we had to get this you know, plug to, you know, to clear everything, if you want to put it in, we had to run this thing at a 70 degree angle, you know. So, come in at a 70 degree angle, you, uh, you know, you, you come out in the dome, you tend to have a little, uh, uh, you're low down here and then you're high here, so you got to sort of like blend this in, you know, come into the combustion chamber. But uh, I think this thing will uh, work out pretty good for three quarter, right, right just before the combustion chamber. The end of the plug is there. And I put a helicoil in there because uh, this is pretty tough aluminum, but I like to put helicoils in there. most anywhere I can do it. Anyway, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna try and, uh, and uh, follow through on a machining of, a, of the front head so uh, both me and you can uh, see what's involved. Okay, now we're setting up for the, uh, the uh, front head and uh, you see this is what we're gonna be working with. Now we got a little, there's a little pilot hole that's cast into the head, but that's just a basic reference point. So you got to try to make sure that your plug comes out, plug hole comes out in a feasible place. Now, the magic angle would be set, setting up on these things is 70 degrees, 70 degrees. Normally your, your normal, your left hand spark plugs are, are um, normally 45 degrees. You gotta have a pretty extreme angle because you gotta you gotta be able to clear the uh, top part of the head, you know, where the push rods go through and the pan covers right. Due to uh, both, uh, you gotta be able to get your spark plug and your spark plug socket in. Plus, it's you know you gotta have clearance for your cutter. I had to modify this this cutter that's in the machine right now. You gotta tear the shank down, I mean turn the shank down. This was a uh, number two Morris taper. And I turned that shank down to uh, 9 sixteenths, which is as big as I could be and still clear of the head. So anyway, we're going to try and indicate this thing in now. Make sure that we're straight in this, in our um, x-axis. Our y-axis is the angle already set, so we'll get back. You know what we're doing here is we're we're uh, dialing in our uh, our um, x-axis. You can see that indicator is only moved about a half thou. You know, we're traveling this baby out. We go the full length of that parallel. There was no more than a couple of thou out. Ain't gonna worry. Right now it's about a thou, thou and a half. About a thou and a half.
So we're good in both our X and Y axis. So we're gonna do the dirty D now. Try and get some kind of a nice plug out of this job. Well, as it turned out, I didn't really get enough time to really show the whole setup of doing these spark plugs, but we've got both these heads finished now. And we had to, in fact, we had the extreme angle, spark plug angle coming in at 70 degrees. We had to sort of blend the other half of this in. It's, you know, part of it's up flush to the head and the other part of it's in, sunk in. And uh, that's just the way it is. You're just, you're just too much of an angle. Both of them are like that, but they're pretty much centered. They're centered in the head and sort of like favoring towards the in, intake uh, port there. But uh, look pretty good. I'm really happy with the way these babies came out. Plenty of clearance. Just enough to, to swing a special, uh, special spark plug wrench. I took this one wrench, socket here, turned that baby down. Be clear than thin because you don't have that much much room to uh, to get in there. But anyway, that's pretty much standard procedure anyway. Now we got to get this head set up for a 550 lift cam to where the valves won't crash into each other and overlap the position. Now normally, on any kind of cam with any kind of overlap, these these heads are real critical, and a lot of times we'll have to take and make the intake valve smaller, sometimes by as much as a hundred thousandths and we'll have to sink so have to sink the seats into at least to where we're right around from the end of this valve stem to the to the uh, valve guide boss. We we'd be right around you know one inch uh, six fifty pretty much minimum. We've got to have at least at least three hundred fifty to four hundred thousandths between our two valves when they're closed. So, uh, more or less, to do a lot of a lot of grinding and a little bit of valve turning. But we'll try if I get enough time to show you some of the stuff that we're we're doing. Here's a little close up there in the on combustion chamber. Now over here is what we got. We got this piston. I uh, this <clears throat> motor that I just did for a guy. I just I balanced it, he put it together. And uh he put a nitrous oxide kit on there. And uh, broke I broke it, he told me I told him to break it in real good and everything and he broke it in real good and then he he hit the nitrous and this is what happened. Just wiped that baby out. I don't know what the heck's going on. But uh, called up the guy that he bought it from. <laughs> then it might have had the pressure up too high, and he told him a few things to do. So anyway, what we're gonna do? We're gonna we're gonna uh, run these these uh, horse pistons. Those, 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 that piston there was cast. But uh, let's see. Pistons, we're going to run these. I don't know who exactly makes them for, but this is a RevTech piston. As you can see in the boss of the piston. They're supposed to be pretty good, so we're going to set that baby up for these and see what happens. Signing off. Okay, now that it's raining, I finally got myself into the position where I could start putting this turkey back together and get my bike going. So I got I got some pretty good progress. I got the front end on there, you know, the engines together, the engines in the frame, the rear swinging arms on, and the rear wheel, the drum, shocks. I just throw, basically putting this thing together and seeing what I need as I go. So I'm just gonna basically try to get this thing together and running pretty soon, and then whatever I need. 
you know, I'll just have to acquire. But so far, we're, we're, we're shaping up, we're shaping up real good. There's a back section of the thing, showing the shock detail and the rear wheel, the line of the swinging arm. We're looking pretty stinking good. Still got to get the disc on the front wheel and brakes hooked up. And some wiring and plumbing. But now we're, we're more or less getting into the, you know, the fun aspect of the bike. I see the back gas tanks hanging up there and the rafters. There's my old cop seat. It's a matter of rounding up parts. Getting this turkey turkey taken down the road. Okay, here we are. I just I just finished cleaning the oil tank out and uh, getting that baby uh, mounted on there. Took great care and I had the proper spacers up underneath this plate. You got stainless uh, bolts going through the frame plus a little jam nut on the bottom. And there's a little little uh, I don't know if you can see it, the homemade uh, oil tank mount that I made. It seems to work out pretty good. I've had it on over quite a few seasons. The next step I got to do on this turkey is take this transmission and probably, or I should do, it was pretty cherry when it was in there, you know, last time running it. I don't think it had more than a couple of, maybe, maybe six months max running, maybe, maybe a year, I don't know. All new gears and shafts, close ratio box, close first, second, and third. So, ah, I got a chance to take it apart, pressing the baby up, and it'll be just really, really good. Okay, I've been trying to keep a lot of the, like, brake parts and things as stock as I can. This is the way the... The, uh, the brake lines for uh, 58 to 69 uh, drum brakes were set up. Try to make this line to where it doesn't get cramped or hit by anything. It's sandwich. It just sort of keeps a nice little swirl so it doesn't get caught by the engine case or anything like that. And then we go up here to the junction and then we come back to the, the flexible line which goes back to the backing plate on the rear uh, juice brake setup. So this, this bracket naturally goes right there. But it's sort of unique the way this does go because there's the brake light switch. And then, let's see, you can if you look at the line, plumb in the line it goes down behind the front motor mount. Okay, it's all back in, tucked in between the motor mount and the engine, and it comes out over here on the other side and hooks up to the, the uh, mask. And then we got the old, oh this is original shit, this thing has never really bent, they got a pretty beefy reinforcement, it's old Harley Davidson, all this shit's tight, you know like the bushing and stuff where the shifter goes through, I've had the, this is the original side stand mount. I sort of beef this sucker up because it sort of busted out. I you know, welded that baby up and beefed it. And it's, uh, it's been holding up pretty good. A lot of original stuff I've been trying to keep on this thing. I, I wish a long time ago I didn't get rid of all of it, but as much as I did. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Okay, what you have here now, I got these, uh, 1979 uh, motor in there. These are the cases with the lower end and tack. I'm uh, just I'm just pulling them apart and checking the uh, clearances, my bearings and stuff. We're gonna do a complete uh, rebuild with this thing. My what I did observe on this thing, the pistons did seem to have a a wear pattern that would indicate to me that they were with a you know, slightly tweaked rod. If you look at that wear pattern on a piston, it looks pretty stinking funny out to one side. I did check those 
I just checked those uh, rods on the flat plate with a um, with a pin, and I, I did get a, a twist out of both rods. So I don't know what happened, but we're gonna look into the situation. But we do have quite a bit of work here. We got some pretty, these heads are pretty virginated heads. They, they got the old steel guides in them and looks like somebody beat the dog pants out of box shit out of the thing and got past the point of stickitation. There's the cylinders are pretty sad. When we get through with this thing, we're going to have a pretty, pretty sweet running motor. That's all I can say. Okay, here we are. We're going to take these uh, flywheels and press them out of the left hand case. Now we're going to make sure that we're got a good support under either end of this case and that we're running pretty darn parallel with the head of this press. Now I'm going to try to press these things out now. Here we go. Here we go. Really just as slick as we can be. Okay, I'm just gonna put my head underneath these flywheels. I'm gonna catch it. Come down. Try to catch it. I'm coming. There it goes. Good firm drop on that old press bar. Well, we got the old fly, fly baby wheels out of there now. Put that press back up. got our left hand case off there now. I'm going to inspect this stuff. Get on with the rest of this, this engine. One thing that sort of bothers me about these crankcases is I don't know if you can see it real good, but where this bottom motor mount is, there's a definite uh, recess in there where the thing was sitting on the case, I mean, was sitting on the frame mount, which indicates to me that this thing was running, was vibrating like a bitch and probably loosened up. Now I got to check out all the particulars. The flywheel on the pinion shaft did have about a 9,000 runoff, but the, the flywheels could also be way out of balance. So we're going to check out all these different aspects, and I'm going to be looking at these cases real close after I get them blasted for, um, for cracks and such things like that. But uh, I've never seen one that badly divotated. There's, I mean, there's a divot in these motor mount, which is pretty, pretty darn deep. Well, you can only hope that these flywheels aren't too bad of shape. And if this guy wants to go back up with a stock 80, and just blueprint this thing out. So we're gonna. Take this thing apart and see what it looks like. Quarter impact wrench does the job pretty good. You don't want to be too hard on these flywheels. We're taking them apart. So we're going to have to take a lead mallet and bam them. Locking tight of them works pretty good, I guess. Factory. You get the bears. Mm. Yep. Go to copper. There we go. You see that locking tight of them on there? You know, that, that lock and tighten them really held onto that pin. Okay, we're going to pull this sucker off. All the bearings are going to fall over the place. And we got bearing below the rod. 
they don't look too bad right off the bat. Crank bit don't look too horrible. Yeah, it's starting to get a little bit of pit to it. Plywood washer, wanna check them. Looks like we got we got a spinning plywood washer. Both of these ones, look at that. Get the slop up the yin yang. We're gonna have to wind up doing. We're gonna have to be to put probably XL washers in there, which are they're bigger diameter, so I can machine them out, put them in there to the depth I want. These cages, bearing cages, don't look too bad. Clean everything up. But uh, let me see. Let's take this engine shaft out. Of here. Probably that fork seemed like a little low, but that shaft knocked it out of there for a You get a copious amount of lock of tight in there. And take this pin out. And that came out of there pretty stinking good. Crank pin don't look too bad. Now the eyeball, we'll have to clean it up and inspect. This is going to be a complete rebuild. So, oh, the plywood washer fell out, man, while I was taking it out. See? Put that baby right in with my hand, and it's just sloppier than it. slop itself. And guys, you punch them into it and make up the difference. That's, that's no good. No good. Anyhow, get up some of these little roller bearings. Yeah. Don't look as bad as it could, but I'll bet you we'll find out the percentage on this flywheel balance is pretty stinking far off. Fixes down the road, but I always say. You know what we got here is um, I had already machined out these flywheels for these uh, XL type plywood washers. Now, they're approximately 300 thousandths bigger than the stock FL washers that are putting these plywheels. Now this was a poor job at the factory because this, you see the diameter is 300 thousandths bigger. This thing was a poor installation. This thing had about uh, maybe uh, 10 thousandths too deep on the depth plus uh, Thing was off center about 30 thousandths on both flywheels so they were just sitting in there spinning around and just just not doing too much good but I managed to machine both these flywheels out the, the uh, XL washers as you can see it's a good good sound setup so that's going to be good for these flywheels next thing I'll try to do is balance these things we'll get back on the 
try and get on the track on balance, and especially when I, I got to still get the pistons. So we'll, we'll get back real soon, real soon. Okay. Now what we're doing now is I'm trying to pick proper shafts to uh, run in these flywheels. I'm getting ready to, to balance the things. And I want to have a shaft that, that are perfect. The run in the flywheel is good, and then I, I got a two each flywheel individually. Now here, I don't know if you can... How close you can see this shaft. This shaft had a problem with uh, spinning the flywheel. Now the flywheels are right. But the shaft's wasted. So I've got myself a 